quantum teleportation is not quite like the science fiction idea of teleporting yourself from the spaceship down to the surface of the planet, but it shares a core idea. The idea of quantum teleportation is to transfer a quantum state from one place to another without transferring the specific carrier of that state. So without moving the object itself from the spaceship to the surface of the planet, can we put a similar object or entity on the surface of the planet into the same state as our original object in the spaceship? Of course, we know from the no cloning theorem that we can't in general replicate the object in the spaceship in an arbitrary quantum state. So we may have to destroy the one that was on the spaceship or at least destroy its quantum state. But in return, we'll be putting the corresponding object on the surface of the planet into the same state as the original one on the spaceship. This is actually quite hard to do, even for something as simple as a photon. It is, however, an interesting concept to think about, if only to understand if it can be done quantum mechanically, even in principle. Apparently it can be done, at least in theory, so let's look at how we might attempt that. The idea of quantum teleportation is to transfer a quantum state from one place to another without actually transferring the specific carrier of that state. So, for example, we might have photon 1 that's in an unknown superposition of horizontal and vertical polarization. We want the output photon to be in the same state, but without sending photon 1 there. We might even actually destroy photon 1, possibly absorbing it. But we know from the no cloning theorem that we cannot clone photon 1 to produce another output photon in the same arbitrary superposition as photon 1. We also know that simply measuring photon 1, for example with a polarizing beam splitter, together with photodetectors, will not reliably tell us the full quantum state of photon 1. We end up statistically collapsing the state and throwing away quantum information about the original quantum state of the photon. The key to quantum teleportation is to share entanglement. And we can do that by sharing an EPR pair of photons. So here's our EPR source, and EPR stands for Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And those photons, this pair that we create here, are going to be in a Bell state, an entangled state. For example, we could presume here that the EPR photon pair is in this particular Bell state. So note we've got labels here 2 and 3 corresponding to photons 2 and 3 here and we've chosen a particular entangled state with horizontal and vertical polarizations in here, called psi minus 2, 3. The input photon is in an unknown superposition that we could write this way. So it's a superposition of horizontal and vertical polarizations with some coefficients here, but we don't know what those are, and we're not going to know what those are throughout this entire process. The state of all three photons, therefore, can be written like this. So here's the state, the unknown state of photon 1, and here's the state, actually a known state, of photons 2 and 3. We can be sure that we are generating them in a state like this, for example. A core trick in teleportation is to note that this state can be rewritten as a linear superposition of Bell states of photons 1 and 2. So we can easily check that this corresponds to the version here written out in terms of Bell states. But again, to emphasize, we're using the Bell states of photons 1 and 2, not photons 2 and 3. Note that we've managed, therefore, to write this state in terms of the Bell states of photons 1 and 2, which are these states. 
If we now make a measurement in Alice's Bell State measurement box, so here's Alice's Bell State measurement box, and Bob is over here, of the Bell State of photons 1 and 2, we collapse the state into just one of the four Bell State terms. For example, suppose Alice measures this particular Bell state for photons 1 and 2. We can know this answer classically. This is a measurement. It gives a classical result. And hence, we know that the overall system of three photons would now be in the state just the part corresponding to that particular Bell state. Because Alice can tell Bob the result of her measurement by communication over an ordinary classical channel, for example, a telephone line, Bob now knows that photon 3 is in this state, though he doesn't know what these coefficients are. What do we mean by that? He knows that whatever those coefficients were of the input photon, this photon 3 is in this state because the system has been collapsed into that state. Now, this state is not the same as the original state of photon 1. That, by definition, was this state, with a horizontal polarization associated with this coefficient and a vertical polarization associated with that one. That's not what we have here. We have a vertical polarization associated with this coefficient and a horizontal polarization associated with that one for this output photon 3. So as it stands at the moment, photon 3 is not in the same state as photon 1, although it does have the same coefficients involved with it that are still unknown. Well, we can sort this out. Bob could simply rotate the polarization 90 degrees clockwise, turning vertical polarization into horizontal and horizontal into minus vertical. That's what happens if you do that 90 degree rotation. So we would change vertical to horizontal and horizontal to minus vertical by rotating by 90 degrees. It's just a change of axes in the system. And then we could insert what's called a half wave plate. That's a piece of optics that will delay one polarization, the vertical polarization in this case, by 180 degrees. And that would turn the CV coefficient to minus CV, undoing this minus sign here that was a bit of a nuisance. So Bob is implementing a controlled unitary transform here, and his choice of that unitary transform is determined by the classical information that Alice sent over to him of the result of her Bell state measurement of the state of these two photons. Now, she doesn't actually know the state of photon 1, but she knows that this pair of photons was in a particular Bell state. By this controlled unitary transformation, Bob has changed this state for photon 3 into this state, which is the one he really wanted. And he's done this basically by putting in some polarizing components inside this path in here. And he's chosen the settings of those components based on the information he got over the classical channel. So photon 3 is now in exactly the same state as photon 1 was, without either Alice or Bob actually even knowing what that state was. They have not actually measured the state of photon 1, but somehow they've managed to take that state and put it onto the state of photon 3. So they didn't actually have to know CH and CV, these coefficients of the horizontal and vertical polarization of photon 1, and yet they've managed to make photon 3 have exactly these same coefficients. For other results that Alice might have got from her Bell state measurement, Bob implements other polarization manipulations over here. And this presents no fundamental problem. He could, for example, use electrically controlled phase shifters here that can operate quite quickly. In general, Bob is therefore implementing a specific unitary transformation on photon 3, 
a combination here of phase delays and polarization rotations that simply depends on the result he gets from Alice of what she says her Bell state measurement had given her. Hence, for any result from Alice, Bob can put photon 3 into exactly the same state as photon 1 originally had, thus completing the teleportation of the quantum mechanical state of photon 1 onto photon 3. <laughs> Thank you.